Right now on a Wednesday morning, as per normal, it is time for us to be joined by our good friends at the Berkshire Edge. Both David and Marcy join us, and we just take a look at some, and I do mean some, a fraction of the stories that they cover on a daily basis at the BerkshireEdge.com. So we'll say good morning once again to Marcy and David. Good morning. Good morning. So how are, th- how are things in South County? Well, a little uh, damper than <laughs> they have been in the past, for which we're very grateful. We had rain the last three days. I never thought I would be so happy to have rain. Yeah, my, my, uh, we had three uh, mini thunderstorms go by my house, and the grass went from, uh, from uh, yellow to orange to now it's green again. Thank goodness. Yes, yeah, amazing. <laughs> and the traffic is now, uh, uh, you know, moving. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, you know this. Is, you know the story that I really. Uh, I'm glad you led with it. Is what happened in Sheffield over the weekend, uh, the uh, celebration honoring uh, Elizabeth Freeman. Uh, you've got a great story on that, and uh, a lot of takes from a lot of different people. But it really is a, a, a beautiful story. Yes. yes, and that's our new managing editor, Sean Israel Isaacson, who has uh, wrote that, and he did a terrific job. Um, it's a very complete story. So, well, this is a, this is a uh, we're talking about Elizabeth Freeman, uh, otherwise known as Mum Bet, who uh, uh, we, she's a civil rights icon uh, because she was uh, a slave. Who was freed, and um, so her her liberation uh, has been celebrated in um, on so was celebrated in the in August twenty first and on the Sheffield Town Green with the um, uh, with the with the unveiling of a of a statue of her. So it's, it was a, she's been quite a uh, an icon of, uh, <clears throat> yes. of that era. And uh, her story is very interesting. Yeah. You know, she sued for, she was a slave, and she was badly treated by the mistress of the house. Who I right. think, you know, through a, a, a scalding... We're uh, talking about 1781 now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're talking uh, about the time We're when, not talking about yesterday. No, and we're not talking even about, I mean, this is... This is decades and decades ahead of the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, it is. It's about uh, 80 years before the Emancipation became law. This is uh, 1781, and she heard the men, um, you know, she heard her master uh, meeting with some other prominent men in their living room, and they were talking about all people being created equal, and she, she said, said, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> she said, what about me? And so she found a lawyer, um, Lawyer Sedgwick. Right. Um, and uh, he defended her, and they went to court, and they went to the and they won. And they won. And so she won her freedom in 1781. Um, and, uh, you know, she, there was another... Yeah, 80 years before the Civil War. Right. Yeah. Um, and she, uh, I mean, there was an Elizabeth Freeman Center in the Berkshires, which is, uh, um, uh, you know, which is a women's crisis center. I mean, for abused women, they can come to the Elizabeth Freeman Center. And she is buried, you know, the, the Sedgwick family. Um, it's a very famous Stockbridge, Massachusetts family. They have a uh, um, a burial area in the in the Stockbridge Cemetery called the Sedgwick Pie, right? Because they were all they were buried in kind of concentric circles that fan out from the center like a pie, um, and she's buried there. I mean, the Sedgwick it was uh, lawyer Sedgwick who took on her case and won for her, and uh, um, she's buried with the Sedgwick family in the Sedgwick Pie. So it's quite an interesting story, um, and now finally there is a beautiful statue in on the Sheffield Town Green that was unveiled the other day in her memory. I mean, it's a statue of her. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I, well, I guess just the statue is what eight feet tall as well, and yes. uh, and there's <laughs> the, 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 there's distinguishing things on the statue that represent her struggle as well. I just uh, uh, yeah. it, it's a story that just uh, it's a horror story in the beginning that turns into a beautiful story in the end. Yes, yes, and uh, I think it's been terrific that her memory has been uh, so honored, um, and. It's <laughs> 200 years later, but still. Um, but it's been honored all along. This yeah. is the first time we've had a statue. Yep. <laughs> all right, well, I want to move on to your next story because it uh, brings us more into uh, common reality now. Uh, Andrea Harrington, the district attorney, uh, uh, you start off saying that she's been a controversial figure uh, since being elected, uh, and uh, even that election was a little controversial. Uh, if you go back to the election itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But she, Andrea, has been a uh, a pretty uh, uh, active district attorney um, and uh, uh, first woman to hold that post, by the way. Yeah. And she's so, a tough cookie, <laughs> actually. So, I mean, she is in, uh, it's a tough race. I mean, she's got a, a man named Tim Shugru who also running against her, who also has a, in the primary. Um, and, uh, um, you know, he also has a strong record um, of, serving, you know, of serving the public, and he's a lawyer, and he's established um, organizations that help local citizens so it, i mean it's a tough race i mean we are getting lots of letters, lots of letters um in support of andrea we haven't heard that much from the shagru people which surprises me well you know uh andrea harrington was a kind of outlier um when she won yeah she, uh, she and, went against the uh, political establishment and so what they've got is another one of those establishment figures to run against her um in Tim Shagru and uh we'll see just what kind of uh, support she she really has here it's an interesting it, it, it's kind of an interesting um situation because Tim Shagru represents the kind of the political machine in Pittsfield, and Andrea Harrington was always a bit of an outlier, um, as we said. And um, But she has been heavily criticized as well, so, I mean, uh, you know, we're, I mean, we're not necessarily endorsing her, but we are saying that, there, you know, there's a very lively uh, campaign going on, and, uh, um, and you know, we have actually two very lively campaigns going on. We also have another one, which we, David didn't mention in our list of stories today, but um, there's a sheriff's um, campaign going on. I mean, you know, most of us have never paid any attention to what the sheriff does. I mean, I, you know, I think most of us don't even know. Well, or as, as he's formally called the high sheriff. The high sheriff, right. As opposed to the lower sheriff. <laughs> Actually, in, in Massachusetts... Just, just, who direct tar traffic at Tanglewood. In, in Massachusetts, the high sheriff actually supplies okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a very uh, um, vigorous race going on with the, uh, uh, the incumbent Sheriff Bowler being... Uh, Tom Bowler. Tom right. Bowler being... Um, being challenged by somebody named Alf Barbalunga, who has so far sent us 26 press releases. <laughs> uh, and, you know, in anticipation of the primary. So it's like every day there's new press releases. You know, he is trying the patience of the media. I, I mean, I don't know, you know, we, we can't put up all of these uh, press releases. Um, so... You know, so, but this, I think, for most of us, this is the first time that we even realize that we elect a sheriff. <laughs> well, they run the jail. Yes, yeah, they do. And, and they yeah. direct traffic. And if you've ever gone to Tanglewood, you have encountered the a core of uh, sheriffs, deputies, directing traffic and getting the cars into their appropriate they, parking lots. And they serve subpoenas. And they serve subpoenas. So they... they um, that's their, and they run the jail. 
Yeah. That's their other um, the big responsibility they have. The House of Correction, I should say, as it's formally known. Right. Uh, so, but so. It, it's, it's similar to Dutchess County where the sheriff operates the jail, but the sheriff also... Uh, uh, in, in Dutchess County, has a whole raft of officers and uh, and a big department uh, that are out on road patrols and and, and that police the county. So right. that's, that's a big difference in what's going on. What what you have uh, there and, and that. That's right. I don't think the sheriffs here patrol, uh, but they they do have traffic duties in terms of uh, you know uh, doing. Uh, you know, crowd control and traffic at like Tanglewood and so on, but um, and they and the jail. Well, and they are a vestige of the county government, and we no longer have a county government right. in in the, in Berkshire County. So this, they, so they're kind of, you know, outliers. Yeah, we have we have that type of a, a sheriff here in in Litchfield County. They transport prisoners to and from jail, yeah. uh, and 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 do and do things like that. And the sheriff is elected uh, here, in uh, in Litchfield County as well. And it is a holdover of a of a government gone, uh, you know, retired many many years ago. Yeah, the county government, right? But you know, the sheriffs do have some political uh, clout. Um, and so it is a, um, at least they've been, you know, fixtures of the Democratic machine here in Berkshire County, which is, uh, uh, you know, has been ruling the roost here for many years. <laughs> so, but in any case, uh, this is a little bit of a contest. So uh, we'll see how that turns out. All right now we uh, in Connecticut we're we're only here for in Region One we're only about a week away from the start of school. Uh, Berkshire, I guess in, your, in 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 uh, and I guess in South County you're not that far yeah, away. Well, no, we're starting Monday, August 29th. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's coming just coming Monday. Yeah, right. uh, and uh, you've got a story here on the on uh, uh, Peter Dillon, the uh, su- superintendent, assuring community and parents and teachers that uh, the school year will be productive. Yes, and uh, and it'll be in person. Yes. Um, so um, and and they also um, have uh, um, you know the, the, the um, Peter Dillon, the superintendent, said that they are really focused also on children's emotional needs, um, and they have started an advisory program where, t- where teachers will connect to students to help with their social and emotional needs um, because it's been a very difficult time for students in the last couple of years. Yeah, that's right. Um, and also, I mean, the other, um, you know, the other thing is they have a $250,000 grant from the Barr Foundation um, to... Um, Think about the, the sort of the physical redesign of school buildings and uh, um, how how they how they structure what young people are doing in high school. I mean, um, you know they've so I mean they're they're um, they used to divide ninth graders into three groups: honors, college prep, and standard. And this year, you know, beginning with the ninth grade, the beginning of high school, they have their students in one group. Um, but they claim that there's still um, a, a range of opportunities f- for them. Now, this has been very controversial, you know, because um, it's very good for integrating kids who are, you know, not the best students into, you know, they, they're not being sort of, um, segregated out into a, a, a slower group. Um, but there have been complaints from, you know, the parents of, of um, more adept students that they're being held back. So this is, uh, um, I mean, this is this is a new program, and we'll see how the community accepts it. You know, they're also they're also um, offering um, more vocational programs in automotive and horticulture, um, and and uh, woodworking, manufacturing, and computer businesses. And they also the school is. 
introducing internships for restaurant and hospitality programs. So it's, um, you know, they are, I mean, there, there's a lot going on in school. Yeah, sort of an overhaul. Yeah. yeah. You know, when, uh, so when I, when I was in high school, we had uh, uh, general college prep and humanities uh, uh, curriculums. Yeah. But what you could, do, what they found out, and what they did, is that even people in the general category, if they excelled in certain categories, mm-hmm. they can then move up and take a college prep course, or they could take yeah. a humanities course. And it was the same thing with with college prep. If you had something that you needed a little more work on, you could drop down and take the general course. Uh, and I always thought that that was a, a really efficient way uh, to keep the school interactive, the students interactive, and to and to keep students uh, on the on the on the right path to learning. I always just thought that was a, a really smart idea. Right. Um, shall we move on? Yes, yes we can. We we'll move on. Your, we're going to run out of time. Um, we'll, we'll, let's go to New Marlboro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, there's, there is, uh, you know, there's a, a wonderful actor named John Douglas Thompson. He's an African-American actor who's been very prominent at Shakespeare and Company. But he has uh, been prominent on Broadway and all around the country. He's a terrific actor. And the New Marlboro Meeting House is having an audience with him this Saturday afternoon. The 27th. August 27th, right. That Saturday? Yes. Yep. Um, um, so, you know, we have a, an interesting article about that and about, you know, how he came to the Berkshires, why he loves the Berkshires. Um, and, and also, I mean, the New Marlboro Meeting House, which is, you know, um, a, a charming um, old building. I mean, the center of New Marlboro it is the center of New Marlboro. There's hardly anything else. There's that in a... A restaurant. And now a it's a general of, store. And a general store in New Marlboro, but... Uh, Don't forget the general <laughs> store. That's, that's, <laughs> that's where everything happens. <laughs> right. But anyway, this meeting house, is, if, if anybody hasn't seen it or been in it, I mean, they are oh, running... Oh, gorgeous. They're running a series of very interesting Saturday programs over the next six weeks or so. And, uh, you know, I urge people to go, you know, I mean, they are really interesting programs with interesting people um but the place itself is is worth a visit yeah so um and we have one more story but i also wanted to point out before we if while we still have time that uh you know the the new issue of our print magazine out and about with the berkshire edge is uh, available for free all over the berkshires and also being distributed into Litchfield County. And if you can't find the print magazine, we are um, little by little um, publishing um, a digital version of each one of the stories. And so last weekend we put out a, you know, for people who are shopping vintage and antiques, we had a terrific story about what the trends are in vintage and antiques and also a resource guide of... uh, um, all of the major shops in the Berkshires and in Litchfield County and Columbia County where you can buy vintage and antiques. So it's a terrific resource, as is our magazine. I mean, the magazine is completely focused on places to go and things to do. It has summaries of towns, and, um, including Salisbury in Connecticut and Hillsdale in New York, of you know, each one of these towns, what's new, what there is to do, and what's happening uh, the, during during the season, I mean, this this issue focuses on August, September, and October, and then we'll have another one in November, December, January, and February. But this one is a very lively issue, and so I recommend your listeners either pick it up or go to the magazine section of the Edge and see the wonderful articles that we have there. And where is it available for pickup? Um, you know, I don't, I don't have the list right now. But it's, avail- um, but it's available at shops it's and available. stores. It's available. It's generally available. Yeah. It's distributed by the same people who distribute brochures. Okay. Um, and it is, it is available. Um, otherwise, it is online. And uh, if you go to our magazine section or you see an ad, you can link. We have a digital flipbook version of the entire magazine also available online. So if you don't find the hard copy, you can read you can read it 
Um, and you can see individual magazine, individual articles in our magazine section with live links to the places we talk about, which you can, that, that's the great advantage of having the articles online is that <coughs> all the links are now live, yeah. um, which you can't do in print. Right. Although we do now have QR codes um, throughout the magazine. That's, that's the latest, um, which will take you to information. But, so the magazine is a tremendous resource. It's tied in with our calendar. Um, you know, so I just want to re- remind people that we have both the magazine and a fantastic online calendar. Um, where you can find out all the things that are going on. And much to our surprise, um, Labor Day no longer signals the end of the season around here. Um, you know, our our theater reviewer sent us a list yesterday of the plays that he's going to be reviewing in September and October and even into the beginning of November. And it is very surprising how much stuff is continuing to go on um, past the traditional end of summer. So... We're becoming much more a year-round cultural uh, community, which is very exciting. All right. I want to get to the final story because yeah, the final story. It, 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 yeah, it's down, <laughs> downsizing in a way about uh, the Tiny House Association uh, made a presentation to the select board. Yeah. This is the American Tiny House Association. Uh, and um, this is a, a very unusual... <laughs> Um, an, an unusual organization, but uh, in any case, they are—they are what they say. They are a national association proposing a, a a tiny house, tiny houses, rather as a way to solve the affordable housing crisis. Um, and, and a tiny house is defined as being movable, right. being under four hundred square feet. Um, but cannot be built any less than 150 square feet because they have to comply with local building costs. Right. Um, and it says, they say that uh, a tiny house can be built for about $20,000 to 150000 depending on the size of the building and the amenities in the house. So, um, and Great Barrington passed a bylaw in 2020 that allows movable tiny houses as accessory dwelling units. So, um, you know, we have a terrible housing shortage, and the tiny, tiny house people are proposing that people consider building tiny houses. Um, and we have, by the way, in our real estate section, we have a terrific article by, an, by a designer named Rich Holbin. He did a whole article about tiny, tiny houses that had been built in the Berkshires, with pictures of them and why they're why they're uh, they're called accessory dwelling units ADUs, right? Um, so, all right, uh, tiny houses, tiny houses, tiny houses. Right. And, and you don't are, have to be tiny to have a tiny house. <laughs> no, not at all. I see, I see. We're, we're not we're not talking about you know elves. Tiny people. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, these stories and many 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 more you'll find uh, on a daily basis, twenty four hours a day at the BerkshireEdge dot com. And uh, David and Marcy will speak to you again next week. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you. Good Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, the Berkshire Edge, once again, is available at theberkshireedge.com.